Welcome to Discover Your Spiritual Identity. I am so excited about this program and sharing with you the revelation God's downloaded into my spirit about a name for God's people that is commonly used but rarely understood in its depth. Let's go to Acts chapter 2 verse 47 to discover that title. Actually, this is the final description of something that took place the day the church was birthed into existence. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in the upper room, cloven tongues of fire appeared over their heads. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to preach the gospel in multiple languages. 3,000 people came into the kingdom that day. The Russian mighty wind that flowed into the upper room, flowed out to the streets. And Peter, I guess you could call him the first street preacher, gathered in the harvest. What a tremendous thing took place that day. And it was just the beginning of something great God was doing in the earth. And Acts 2.47 says, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Well, the first thing that impresses me about that verse is that the church is not a work of man. The church is a work of God. It was supernaturally birthed into existence that day. It was the product of a divine intervention that was unseen prior to that time. There had never been a manifestation of the power of God as took place on the day of Pentecost. God do again something that's never been seen before. Also, in John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus indicated that no man can come to me, he said, unless the Father who has sent me draws him. So the people who came into the kingdom that day were drawn by the Holy Spirit. They didn't just make a choice out of their own intellect to become a part of the church it was a supernatural move. It was a spiritual invitation. The Holy Spirit knocking at the doors of their hearts. So Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. And I'm sure that day he authored within all those 3,000 people the ability to believe that the one who was crucified not too long prior to that and raised from the dead was also the Messiah, the long-form Messiah that they had talked about for decades and centuries and prophesied about even for millennia. So praise God for the birth of the church. What a wonderful day that was. See, the church is not just a mere organization built by man. It is an organism it is a living body of believers fused together by a common experience, not by a denominational role. You're not in the church because you belong to a certain organization or denomination. You are in the church if you, like those on the day of Pentecost that responded to Peter's preaching, have been born again, if the Spirit has drawn you and you've had an encounter with the Lord, then you're a part of the true church, regardless of what denomination you may belong to. It's a trans-denominational body of believers. Let's go to the original Greek. The word that was translated church is ekklesia, and the word ekklesia means the called out ones. Well, that covers a lot of territory, because if you're in the church, you've been called out of religion into spirituality. You've been called out of darkness into the light of God's truth. You've been called out of depression into joy, out of anxiety into peace, out of demonic control into the protection of angels, out of spiritual death into the awakening of the life of God within your spirit, and out of time into eternity because the gift of eternal life is the greatest gift that comes the moment you join the church. And you join the church by surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus. Now, very important question. Is there a false church and a true church? And if so, how is it discerned? Well, there's over 2 billion people in this world who claim to be Christian. But the majority of them 
have not been born again. They have not had an encounter with Jesus. They're part of different organizations that claim to be able to impart salvation to them by following certain church doctrines, creeds, rituals, ceremonies, etc. But there's a difference between the professing church and the possessing church. The professing church is made up of all the millions upon millions of people who profess faith in a historical Christ, but they don't know him personally, and that's essential because Jesus in John chapter 17 said that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So it's not concerning having an intellectual knowledge about his existence. It's concerning an intimate soul connection, a soul knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's knowing him in a personal way. That's essential to salvation. So we've been called out of the world into this wonderful blessing of being citizens in the kingdom of heaven. See, we're a part of heaven right now. Even though we are not experiencing the full glory of it, the Bible says we are citizens of heaven. And that happened the moment we became a part of the church because it is an organism, not an organization that spans uh, two dimensions, if you will, the natural world and the heavenly world, because those who have gone on are a part of the church. Those who are still here are a part of the church. So it stretches from time to eternity. Isn't that intense? Praise God for that. Now, here's another very important question. Is the church found in the Old Testament? Well, you will not find the word church itself in the Old Testament. However, there is a reference in the New Testament to what was termed the church in the Old Testament. And I'll take that, I'll take you to that right now. Actually, it's the tremendous sermon that Stephen preached right before he was martyred, right before he was stoned to death. And in that message, that highly anointed message, his face shining with the glory of God and daring to boldly declare the truth before those who were ready to kill him. In that message, he said this, and it was concerning Moses. He was talking about Moses and he said, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the words of life to give unto us. So Israel, having just come out of Egypt, is referred to as the church in the wilderness. Now let me insert another bit of information here. The word ecclesia, the Greek word that is translated church is found about 115 times in the New Testament, but not only is it, uh, is it translated into the word church, it's also translated into the word assembly. And so it means a gathering of people. It means a community of called out ones. And see, Israel was called out of Egypt into the wilderness I'm sure the land of Goshen was a much nicer place to live than the wilderness of sin as far as the physical location. But they had God with them in the wilderness, and that made it better. Sometimes you may have been better off before you got saved financially than you are now or materially than you are now. Maybe you were like me. I lost everything when I got saved because I was a teacher of yoga at four universities, in Tampa, Florida, I ran a yoga ashram, and I had everything I needed financially. I didn't have much, didn't want much, but I had a home where we ran the ashram. But then I got saved and shut down all my classes and closed my ashram, and I was penniless. So I wasn't in a better condition materially, but I was in a whole lot better condition spiritually. And that's what matters most. Israel was the church in the wilderness. And this God who had brought them out of Egypt's bondage, 
and brought them into a place of freedom, went before them as a pillar of fire by night and a cloudy pillar by day. And I've often wondered how it felt to have the warmth of the radiance of the light of that pillar of fire reaching out to the extremity of the camp of Israel, probably several million people, as if God was embracing them all with his arms. The church in the wilderness called out of a life of, of abuse, a life of grief, being enslaved in a foreign nation into a life of knowing the creator of the universe. How wonderful is that? Now, I believe that the Israelites who served God, who covenanted with God, who were in a proper relationship with God under the old covenant standard, when they died, they went to the lower parts of the earth and we find that in Luke chapter 16, the story Jesus gave about the rich man and Lazarus, there was a chamber called Abraham's bosom where the righteous went to. Before the blood of Jesus was shed, there was no way they could actually go directly to the presence of God in the third heaven. And so there had to be a temporary holding place, so to speak. But I believe all of the Israelites who covenanted with God under the old era, in the old period of time, the ancient period of time when God had a different standard he went by than he does now, uh, I believe they were waiting for the Messiah in the underworld. And when Jesus died, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now we find that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9. And Peter also talked about it. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, he talked about how Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive or quickened by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Now, that passage makes it sound like not only did Jesus preach in Abraham's bosom to the righteous, but he preached in the other realm across the impassable gulf, the realm of the wicked, where those who were sometime disobedient in the days of Noah were. It, we don't know what happened down there. But what I do believe absolutely is that a nation was born at once, like the prophet said. And that all of those who were waiting for the Messiah in the lower worlds somehow were born again. They received Jesus. The Holy Spirit came into their hearts. They were regenerated. Jesus led captivity captive. And they went from Abraham's bosom all the way up to paradise. What a spectacular moment that was. You talk about shouting, angelic rejoicing. You talk about a celebration in the higher world. Praise God, it must have been something far beyond my ability to describe. No wonder in 1 Peter 4, 6, the Bible said, For this reason the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. That's when, more than ever before, the church in the wilderness in the Old Testament became a part of this organism that spans both covenants, the church of the living God that is an eternal institution or an eternal uh, group of people who are under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, when was the first mention of the church in the New Testament? Are you aware of the first time that word, other than Stephen's preaching, surfaces in Scripture? It's in Matthew chapter 16. And this is when Jesus is nearing the end of his ministry and he takes his disciples to a very unlikely location in order to share with them some thoughts about this coming group of people referred to as the church. He took them to Caesarea Philippi, which is right at the base of Mount Hermon, right before you get to the Golan Heights. And it was an area that, well, I need to share some real 
eye-opening information in just a few moments. But first, let me read this passage out of Matthew chapter 16. And the first time that Jesus mentions why he came to earth and what he's going to form after he leaves, or the majority of the reason why he came to earth. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter responded immediately and said, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. Once again, the church is something supernaturally brought together by the Father. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say unto you, you are Peter, which means a little stone. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The King James Version says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he said to Peter, and I believe also to the other disciples that were there, I believe he cast his eyes to all of them when he said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus, the Messiah, which is so curious, so strange that it wasn't time to tell it in that location, but it was going to be the time to tell it shortly afterward. Well, I know the Catholic Church that I was raised in teaches that Peter is the rock, the first pope on which the church was built, and it was Peter who received the keys to the kingdom. But in Matthew 18, 18, the power to bind and loose is also given to the entirety of the church, all believers. And so we all have the keys, and I'll explain more what those keys are in just a moment. But what did Jesus mean when he said, on this rock I will build my church? If it wasn't Peter that he was talking about, and notice if it had been Peter that was being referenced, Jesus would have said, you are Peter, and on you I will build my church. But he didn't say on you, he said on this I will build my church. What? Back up a little bit. He said, flesh and blood hasn't revealed to you that I am the Messiah, but my Father which is in heaven. And then he said, on this rock I will build my church. The stable thing producing the church is that it's constructed by divine revelation. It was divine revelation that came to me that brought me out of Eastern religions in 1970 and brought me to a knowledge of salvation. My mind screamed out against the idea that there was only one way to heaven. It had to be a supernatural draw, revealing to me that Jesus was not just one of many gurus, not just one of many ascended masters, but that he was singularly the only begotten son of God, the only son begotten only of the Father, incarnated into this world, to die in our behalf on the cross and to be raised from the dead to conquer all the opponents we face in this world. It took God to open my eyes to that. On this rock, I will build my church and nothing can shake me from it. If the whole world stood against me and said, you're wrong, you're deceived, this is ridiculous, it's absurd for you not to include all other religions in your worldview, I would smile and try to love them back and say, I'm sorry. God has revealed to me that Jesus is the only way. I can't be shaken from it. If I had to die for it, I'd have to die for that belief because I cannot be shaken from it. On this rock, I will build my church, Jesus said. My called out ones, called out of the deception of religion, false religion. And why did he choose that location, Caesarea Philippi, to say the gates of hell will not prevail against my church? Because Caesarea Philippi was referred to as the gate of Hades. And the King James Version 
wrongly translates it hell because hell is envisioned as a place for just the wicked to perish forever, a place of tormenting flames. And so you don't get the real picture of what was being said. In the Greek, it's the word Hades. And Hades was the underworld where, according to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, there were two chambers, the chamber of the wicked, an impassable gulf, and the chamber for the righteous called Abraham's bosom. They were both in the lower parts of the earth, see? Why there? Because the physical location was, in a sense, a portal into a spiritual realm. And the two were concentric. They were uh, they occupied the same space interdimensionally, so to speak. Just like your soul and your spirit are not visible, but they're centered in your physical body and all occupy the same space interdimensionally. And uh, I don't really like using that word to describe a spiritual reality, but that's the best way I can say it. Now, why was Caesarea Philippi considered to be the gates, the gateway, the entranceway to Hades. Because originally, in the days when Baal was worshipped by the Canaanite tribes that inhabited that region, there was a large cave there, a huge cave, which is there to this day. And out of that cave that was fed by 72 springs that would all flow together together, to provide this gushing water that would pour out of that cave, many heathen pagan rites took place. It was kind of a sacred spot for them for their pagan rituals. And it uh, was actually a very suitable place for Jesus to make a statement about the gates of Hades. Now, later on, it became an occult center for Grecian gods to be worshipped, specifically the god Pan. In fact, uh, it was taught that Pan was born in the mouth of that cave and that every fall, the gods descended back down into the lower world when winter came on the earth. And then in the spring, they would ascend up out of the lower parts of the earth, uh, Hades, in order to influence the planet again. And there was a lot of rituals that went on with the worship of the god Pan. In fact, they were extremely wicked rituals, including orgies that, uh, that were indescribably evil, even involving bestiality with goats, and goats were sacrificed in the, the waters that came out of this cave at Benias. It was referred to as Benias. And then later on, it became Peneus or Peneus, uh, which was a reference to the god Pan, who is half human and half goat and has horns and is a very uh, lustful uh, deity, uh, uh, unrestrained lust. And so it was a place where religious deception was at a peak. No Orthodox Jews would go in that region. It was just too defiled, too evil. There were 14 temples all around Caesarea Philippi, including the most famous ones, the Temple of Pan, the Temple of the Dancing Goats, and the Temple of Tiberius Caesar. And uh, the Temple to T Tiberius Caesar honored uh, Julius Caesar, who was declared to be a god at his death, and his adopted son, Augustus Caesar, was declared to be a god, and now Tiberius Caesar was worshipfully adored at the temple there in this location. So no wonder Jesus chose that location to reveal who he was, the Christ, the son of the living God, because it was his way of saying, this is all deception. And I'm right here in this stronghold of pagan religion, declaring that I am the true son of God. I am the true incarnation of God in the world to his disciples and to Peter. Praise God for that. So uh, it, was a, it was a very dramatic moment. Jesus was a master storyteller, and he made sure that the environment around him was the best it could be for the proclamation that was made that day. Now, uh, what happened to that cave? Well, an earthquake took place at a certain point. 
that shifted the source of the Jordan River, which this particular place was, not from this opening that was referred to by some as the mouth of Pan, and it shifted it over a significant difference to another location. I believe that was God's way of removing the influence of paganism from his people and bringing a new flow of truth into Israel and to, into all the world. Praise God, because that's what Jesus did. And then he said the most curious thing. He said the gates of hell or the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. Most people interpret that in a defensive stance as if, well, that means when the devil and his demons fight me when the world and its sin entrenched mindsets come against me, when the lower nature tries to wrestle with me, then I will survive. It's a defensive mindset. But that's not what Jesus was communicating because the gates of a city were the most vulnerable place. And if an oncoming army was going to attack a city, they would attack the gates first, usually, because if you could knock down the gates and the gates did not prevail against you, the city would come under your dominion. If you were some superior army coming through the area to subjugate the people to your rule. Well, I believe that was Jesus' way of saying, look at all this ungodly worship that's going on, the temple of Caesar, the temple of Pan, the temple of the dancing goats, all this religious deception will cave under the influence of this rushing new river of truth that's going to come through the world through the disciples. It was his way of defying the enemy at one of his strongholds and saying, you're going down now. You're going down now. And that's what the church is called to do. We have the keys of the kingdom. And what does that mean? That was not just given to Peter. That was given to all of us. I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. What did Jesus mean by that? Well, first of all, binding and loosing was a Hebrew idiom in the days of Jesus. And it meant setting moral boundaries for people. If you bound certain things, you excluded it from what was acceptable in their behavior. If you loosed certain things, then that was made acceptable in a person's life. So binding and loosing involves setting moral parameters for people's lives. In other words, he was saying the church is going to set a new standard in this world a standard of salvation, a standard of deliverance, a standard of divine intervention, a standard of divine revelation, binding people away from the deception and the religion and the ritual and the ceremony that has uh, so terribly ensnared the human race and loosing them into this freedom of walking with God. The keys to the kingdom, well, keys are the means by which you open up something to gain entrance yourself, or to usher others into a place. Well, if he said you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven, then every true member of the church, you go out into the world every day with keys in your hands. You meet depressed people, you've got the key that opens up the door of joy. You meet people on the verge of insanity, you've got the key that opens up the door to soundness of mind. You meet lost people all through your day. You've got the keys that open them up to true salvation, true deliverance, true union with God. You have the keys to the kingdom of God. And the word kingdom simply means a king's domain, the domain over which a king rules. And the kingdom of God is supernatural. It covers the entire globe now. And when you're born again, you are born into the kingdom where you experience the nature and the attributes of the king because the king's personality saturates his kingdom. And when you're in the kingdom, you experience the joy of God, the peace of God, the love of God, the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, the authority of God pouring into your life. Isn't that phenomenal that we as the church of the living God have, have the keys to the kingdom and we can usher people out of defeat's grip into a place of liberty and freedom and victory. Praise God. We are the church. We are the called out ones. And I'm going to pursue this even more 
in the next episode of Discover Your Spiritual Identity. I urge you to get your copy of Who Am I? Dynamic Declarations of Who You Are in Christ. Just go to shreveministries.org, go to the store and get your copy and begin learning about the names and the titles that belong to you. And also I urge you to subscribe to my other podcast, which is called Revealing the True Light. And on that podcast, we explore comparative religion subjects, and also we take issues within Christendom that are very controversial or rarely understood and need clarification, doctrines, ideas that need to be uh, revealed by uh, the spirit of truth and the word of truth. And so please subscribe to Revealing the True Light. And you can do that by going to shreveministries.org going to the category called media, scrolling down to podcasts, and you'll find the information there. Thank you for joining me.